Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Take, our midweek interview. Um, this week, uh, me and Sam actually had the pleasure of having a chat with Jason Figgis. Um, so yeah, hope you guys enjoy it. Take a listen, give us a like, give us a comment, give us a subscribe, and as ever, enjoy. So this is uh, Trash Arts Take with Jason Figgis. How you doing, man? You good? Very good. There'll probably be a slight delay on this, I'd imagine, because uh, it always seems to be the way on this end on WhatsApp. But uh, we'll get there. That's what <laughs> editing's for. Yeah. I was just about to say that. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. How are you? Are you good, Brian? I'm good. I'm good. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Jason. We really appreciate it. Well, I, re I really appreciate being asked. It's nice to do something other than, you know, write in one's attic, you know, on this uh, lockdown that we're all experiencing. So it's nice to be able to chat to people, like-minded people, you know. Oh, totally, man. H how actually did you get into filmmaking? How I got in was, it was a kind of a weird, circuitous route. I mean, I'd always been a huge fan of film, you know, ever since I was a kid. And I always thought, hey, wouldn't it be amazing being a filmmaker and being the guy behind the camera telling those actors what to do and, and making them, you know, become a, the part of a story that you had created. In a way, kind of, you know, manipulating everyone around you to do what you wanted them to do <laughs> in a creative sense. But I ended up, I ended up becoming a dealer accounts manager for O2. You know, I mean, it couldn't be a more different job. And um, But I, I just kept going, you know, I really want to get into film, so... I went to a local uh, camera shop and I said, any possibility that you'd lend me one of your, I think at the time it was a Canon XM1. I don't know whether you've you've you you heard of a Canon XM1. Was it a mini? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No. Well, it's yeah. a very small, you know, um, mini DV camera. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah I used to have one. The crazy thing was, at the time, uh, networks used to broadcast mini DV. They, they didn't care at all. They were like, if it looks good, we'll broadcast it, no problem. So there were none of these silly rules of, oh, you better have 4K content now or we're not going to look at you. you know? um, so I just happened to be a massive fan of um, a photographer called Sir Simon Marsden, who did all these books on, you know, kind of gothic architecture really beautiful infrared photography and i wrote to his agent and uh because i didn't know how to get to him and i i literally wrote you know i put a pen on paper and i stuck it in an envelope and sent it to his agent so a proper letter you know <laughs> and uh the agent uh, forwarded on to simon and then one day i'm walking down the street and simon calls me and i thought it was a mistake but simon had the richest you know he talked like that an incredibly deep aristocratic accent you know talked like that and i thought who could this be i don't know anybody that could do a voice like that and it turned out it was him we ended up becoming really good friends and then when he was doing a book called the twilight hour um it's funny at this very moment i'm staring at the charity poster for it it's right here in front of me but um he uh he said look i'm going to be coming over to ireland he fancy coming with me and i said well funny you should say that um a camera shop has lent me um the latest state-of-the-art Canon XM1 mini DV camera. And, uh, you know, do you want me to film it as we go along? And he kind of looked at me dubiously and he said, well, people have offered to do that before and nothing ever came of it. And I said, well, look, I'm really determined to make a film. So why don't we see what we get? So we started looking, you know, we'd, we'd roll back the tape. Imagine that we had to roll back the tape. And um, <laughs> we'd look at everything and uh, he loved it. So he started giving me his attention and it went from there. We ended up getting John Hurt on board because he loved what we had done. And he bookended it with um, with a bit of narration, you know, of Edgar Allan Poe at the beginning of the end. Well, obviously bookending. And... Uh, and then we ended up getting an agent in Los Angeles, and it ended up getting out there, and Sky, not Sky, Discovery Network bought it, and they distributed it to 150 countries oh, through Discovery fun. Civilization. So it kind of went from there. Do you know? And, do you, uh, yeah, so that was the beginning, a very long-winded way of telling you how I got into it. Do you think that one of the reasons why you got um, such a great success from it is because it was a documentary? Because I know you started in documentary before you went into narrative. Sorry, say that again. I, I missed that last bit. Um, I know that you went into uh, documentary filmmaking um, before narrative filmmaking. Or yeah, fictional. I know I did. Yeah, I went into I went to the documentary before narrative. So I always planned on just doing documentary because I thought, you know, 
you can't get more social realist than making a film about real people doing real things. And I've always been a huge fan of social realism. I love Ken Loach. Um, I love people like Richard Woolley, you know, uh, back in the 70s and the 80s. I love Kitchen Sink. I love that kind of stuff. But it was only when I did the documentary and I kind of thought, and I, I got together with like-minded people and I thought, you know, that did really well. But the funny thing was, even though I planned on then doing a feature film of a graphic novel that I'd been working on with my brother called The Altar Boys, which became Three Crosses, which was given that awful bloody name once upon a time in Dublin by the distributor in the US, um, it, we had decided, yeah, we'll try that out. But in the meantime, when the Twilight Hour happened, um, I got a phone call one day while I was still working uh, for O2, and it was Uri Geller, the spoonbender Uri Geller. And he was he rang me, and I, again, I thought it was a joke, and I said, yeah, right, this is Uri Geller, you know? And he's like, no, Jason, this is Uri Geller, I promise you. And I said, what's that noise behind you? And he goes, I'm on my stationary bike. <laughs> so, so he said to me, listen, I've seen your film, The Twilight Hour, and I think we should work together. So I said, well, that'd be fantastic. You know, I'd, I would absolutely love to work with you. And then in the meantime, somebody else had seen The Twilight Hour and they invited me to come over to London to direct a film for Sky Arts called The Maverick in London, which was about the King's Head Theatre in Islington on Upper Street. And I thought, brilliant. So I spent the whole summer there in an apartment that they got for me with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And we like were married like 15 years this year, actually. And uh, so um, she... She came over, joined me with a great old time, worked there for three months, met everybody. I mean, Alan Rickman was in the documentary, had a great old time with them. Ken Russell, not Ken Russell, he was dead at the time. Um, um, Michael Winner, oh, he was a, he was a blast, um, as you can imagine. And lots of cool people like Joanna Lumley had to be the nicest. I walked the entire length of Upper Street with her linking my arm oh, really? when I brought her back to her car. Amazing. <laughs> Everyone did a double take. Every single person on the street did a double take when they saw who it was, and I was I was being like cock of the walk, as you can imagine. You yeah. know, Joanna Lumley on my arm down the street, Purdy. You know, to me it's Purdy. It's not fucking Abfab. You know, am I allowed to curse on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just YouTube. It's all good. <laughs> I love how you it's clarified that after. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, well, let's... So, yeah, so, we not, so we ended up doing that, and that was Sky Arts. And then it was only in the middle of doing that that Uri Geller arrived in town. He said, look, Jason, let's meet up. We'll meet up in um, some, somewhere lovely, actually. I can't remember where it was, some little restaurant. And um, he, uh, he said, look, um, I've got us a meeting at Sky One. You know, we can go into Sky and we can meet Dawn Airy, who was the head of Sky at the time, and said, let's pitch them something. And I said... Well, and, oh, this afternoon, and I'm like, you're fucking kidding me, right? <laughs> I've got nothing prepared. Well, they've seen the Twilight Hour, and they think it's really good, so let's just use that. So we went in, and this meeting in the boardroom at Sky, and uh, Dawn is sitting there, and uh, commissioning editors and stuff, and Uri just says, okay, this is Jason Figgis, he's about to pitch. And I'm like, oh, what the fuck, what the fuck am I pitching? You know? <laughs> and just in the moment, I said, how about we do something called Uri's Haunted Cities? And they're like, right, that's interesting. Okay, where would you like to go? And I thought the first place that came to mind is that we'll go to Venice. We'll film the first one in Venice, the pilot. And they went, oh, okay. And then the meeting ended, all went well. And then the next minute we're commissioned and we're like, you're going wow. to Venice on a recce and you're doing this show, a 90-minute feature for Sky One going out at 9 p.m. On, I think on a really prestigious night of the year and they ended up even though I'm not a massive fan of the film I have to say um, it uh, didn't quite turn out the way they promised they'd allow me you know make it turn out it was, there was a lot of interference um, so when it was put on though they ended up getting more viewing figures that bigger bigger rating not well the ratings can't remember what it's called bigger viewing figures than any other homegrown show that ever made so they offered us an entire series right and I thought absolutely brilliant. Would have been worth six hundred thousand to my company, wow. uh, you know, just as the just as the you know the company fee. And uh, everybody in Sky who was involved in the project left Sky. And when the new people came in, you know, the whole idea of the the, the new broom sweeps clean. No one was interested. So that was the end of that. Oh, that's yeah. a shame. Oh yeah, it's that oh, fickle it nature awful. in it. It's the fickle nature of the indie scene. Well, well, any sort of filmmaking, really. 
it's really interesting, Jason, that like <clears throat> your story, you, you're probably very much like me, is when you start to tell a story, you go into finite detail. Um, but it's yeah. really cool how you just, you kind of were really proactive. I know that a lot of people within this industry sometimes want stuff to be handed to them or they do maybe one project yeah. and they expect that they should get like a massive return. You've kind of, I would say it's quite the well, luck of the Irish, if you will. Um, but you seem to have landed on your feet with quite a number of the earlier projects. It was, yeah, it was a weird scenario. But I'll tell you, I mean, like, yeah, it started off that way. But after that, it became quite a chore because I, th I think because I moved away from doing documentaries and from doing stuff that I had a huge passion for, things started slowing down. It was almost as if the universe said look, you're not really doing what you're meant to be doing. you gotta, you got to get back onto that path. So I ended up doing a lot of things like, you know, I ended up, uh, I ended up teaching drama to kids in a, in, a, in a place called the Mill Theatre in Dundrum in Dublin. And, uh, and, and from that, I thought, you know, okay, I'm getting to do what I love. I'm getting to work with kids and, you know, teach them the fine art of, of acting for camera. But at the same time, I'm going to start developing projects with them and maybe do some summer project films with them. So we end up doing a film called Children of a Darker Dawn. I've had a thing called Virus X, which is rather uh, pertinent at the moment. And uh, and then I did another one the following summer called The X, The Invisible Man. Now, the mad thing was, these were summer projects with teenagers with no experience, and neither film was ever meant to see the light of day. But both of them ended up getting international releases almost despite themselves. Nice. So with both films, I think Children of a Darker Dawn, we were on best horror films of the year lists and worst horror films of the year <laughs> lists. So we were, we were loved and despised in equal measure. And I mean really despised in equal measure, uh, you know, as well as loved. So we got incredible love from people. Oh my God, this is like, you know, it's like where did you find these kids and this is incredible how did you do this and I'm like it was a fucking summer project it's really <laughs> what it was I was bored out of my shite and I said well at least I get to make a movie with kids who are excited about making a movie I mean the kids were more gruesome than me they were like more blood more blood there's not enough blood in I mean I had I had like teen cannibals actually I had seven and eight year old cannibals in this film, you know I mean you know Eating guts, eating guts, and these kids loved it. They were like, "Oh, I don't have enough, but why don't I have more blood? She's got more blood than me." <laughs> and then when we went on to the, the summer project with the, with the uh, you know the vampire one, they were like kids tied to trees being eaten by vampires, and the kids were freaking out that the other kid had more blood and guts, and you know. And I, I was just amused by the whole thing. And then I be and, and then I went on from that to do an adult one called Feature Film Project Ireland, and we did a film called Urban Traffic about sex trafficking in Dublin. And again, it was a project teaching actors how to work with camera and how to improvise and how to develop story. It was never meant to see the light of day, and that also got an international release on DVD and video on demand. So I realized that, okay, even with your best efforts here just to do stuff to get by, it's still getting out there. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's getting a platform. So then I started really thinking clearly about what I wanted to do on a very serious level. And uh, so things have moved on. And of course, Sam, you know, like Sam emerged, so, you know, with all the great work that Sam is doing and with Tony Newton as well. And I started saying things like, hey, we're going to put anthologies together. And, you know, you would, and I happen to have a load of stuff like off cuts and things that I couldn't use. And then it all, it all started fitting in it's it's like you know i can actually start putting out all this stuff that i thought would never see the light of day and now that also is seeing the light of day so thanks sam and thanks tony <laughs> that is the beauty though of like when when you do just keep producing stuff and try to get it out there that you find yeah. that there are many platforms out there to get the stuff out you know yeah i mean look i'm proud of everything i've done i know you know a good portion of it isn't very good but what it has done is that it's allowed me to develop as a an artist, you know, in the world of film and become better and keep all of the good things that, that I've learned how to do well and then try and avoid the things that I didn't do so well or at least become better at them so that now I know, okay, that doesn't work and now I know how to make it work. So I'm, I'm the first person to hold up my hand and go, oh, no, no, I agree, that was a pile of shit. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, 
I'm under no illusion. I, 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 I'm the least delusional person out there. I would never sit down and go, what are they saying? That was a work of fucking genius. <laughs> you know, I'm not that person. I'm not that person, you know. I'm always thinking, oh, the next film will be the one that I really love. Or not even the big one, but that I'll get it right in such a way that I'm incredibly happy to sit at any premiere or you know premiere either you know a national premiere or an international premiere that i'm happy to sit in and watch it with an audience now that started to happen you know relatively recently when i did the new documentary on Mar- simon marathon called simon mars and the life and pictures i absolutely loved that film and it ended up premiering at the bfi um, and actually, I met Alice. I think you you, you recommended Sam that Alice Maholland come down and meet me, and she came and attended. And we had yes, a lovely she did. Yeah, yeah. Very talented girl. Still, kind of wait to make that vampire movie with her. We're just definitely going to happen. Excellent. Um, and that's actually it's in really really good planning at the moment. And again, I feel that if I'd made it back then, back in 2018, it wouldn't be the film that I know it will be now. So I think that's a kind of an important thing. I think when you look at a project, you're planning something, but put it aside until you know when you can make it the way you really want to make it. So I've done that with a few things, and, and that's worked out really well. So, um, so yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm feeling now. There's also well, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but may, maybe ask your next question because I'm just going to end up answering maybe <laughs> everything on one question. Well, I was actually going to move on to yeah the more recent productions you've done um, for you to tell us a bit about Winfred's Creeks, which has obviously just got a distribution deal. But yeah, if you want to tell a bit, tell us a bit more about that. Um, Winifred Meeks. Meeks, yeah, not Creeks. Sorry, yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, but that was a great experience. Now, that's a classic example of something where I had planned to make it in 2016. I always had Lara Belmont on board you know, from uh, the war zone, Tim Roth's The War Zone, because she's the only person that I wanted to really be in the movie because I knew that she could she could carry a film where there were no other living people in it. The entire movie literally just has her in a haunted house dealing with her own, you know, kind of um, emotional problems that she's going through, trying to get a book finished, but then realizing slowly but surely that the house is haunted. Uh, not a necessarily a malevolent ghost, but... So in an upsetting presence, you know, something that not quite right. So I knew that I'd need somebody who was really strong in order to carry that film on their shoulders. And I knew after seeing Lara in the war zone that she was just mind blowing, you know. And uh, so I sent it to her and she had been in pretty much in retirement for a few years because she has three children now and lives down in Brighton. She moved from London to Brighton. So she was really like a mum and she was doing some art projects and that. To the point of when people started seeing pictures going out that all of her new friends were like, are you an actress, Lara? What? Are you an actress? You know, and I'm posting pictures of her with her arm around Tim Roth sitting on a seat and they're like, what the fuck are you doing with Tim Roth? What? Are you an actress, Lara? You know, so all of this. So I sent it to her just thinking, well, I'll start at the top of my list and then I'll start working down. A week later, I got a, um, an email from her and she said, Hi, Jason, just read your treatment. Um, I was on the edge of my seat and you just brought me out of retirement, pretty much. Uh, thank you. That's awesome. And, uh, That's awesome I would yeah. love to do your movie. So I was like, holy shit, okay, now I want to put some effort into this. Originally, I thought of filming it in Cork, but nothing. it, it just wasn't working. You know, Nothing was really coming together. So then it wasn't until two years later when I was hired to direct a documentary, back to the documentaries again, leading on to other things, hired, hired to direct a documentary on M.R. James. And of course, we being M.R. James, we had to shoot in East Anglia. Um, so we were up in Norfolk and Suffolk and, you know, um, filming around and about. And this, this guy, this uh, journalist called John West, basically found out that I was there and he wanted to interview me for Psychic News magazine. And I, I said, sure, absolutely no problem. But by the time I found out, I'd already come home. But we realized in a very short period of time that we had everything in common from our childhood, all these things that we loved, everything that I loved, he loved. And he started knowing more about things, you know, subjects that I absolutely adored. And I thought, wow, this is a person now I could work with on stuff. And he'd always wanted to produce. And he had that bulldog thing. When he came on board with me, 
he started getting publicity for the Simon Marsden film. He basically got he he basically arranged the BFI. All of that happened. We ended up getting sponsored by Nikon. Hey, you know, one of the people I've admired my entire life and wanted to marry her when I was a kid was Haley Mills, and she turned up to the premiere and gave me a hug and a kiss, which was mind blowing. Um, and uh, and and John, I watched him at the BFI, and he just had this thing. You know, he's a really gentle, lovely guy. But he commands attention. It's like, I need this, I need that, I need the other. I realize he'd be a great producer. I asked him to come on board. And before long, he had arranged everything, shooting Winifred Meeks in, in Dunwich, of all places. Absolutely wonderful place, you know, in, in Suffolk. And suddenly, we were making the film um, at the right time with all the right people. Um, so it was, it was just one of those really bizarre scenarios where I made one film and it led me on to meeting somebody else who was going to become part of a new company with me called Figures West. And uh, he thought, it's, oh, we'll call it West Figures, but people think that's a place and they'd be looking for it on the map. <laughs> 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 Just buy a pot of land and uh, call it West Figures. <laughs> West Figures, absolutely, why not? See, Jason... So, uh, again, a long-winded way of telling you how Winifred meets her. No, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, so, Jason, you've worked through a lot of different genres and, like, different mediums within documentary. Do you have, like, a preference of the kind of stories you want to tell in t- certain genres? Yeah, I, I, love, I love emotion. I love emotional impact. And I don't mean cheese. I don't mean sentimentality. I mean genuine uh, emotion where, where even the hardest fucker you know, who thinks he, can, he wouldn't shed a tear, be kind of going to get a bit choked up there, a bit of grit in his eye, you know, oh, there's a bit of grit in my eye. Um, but they're genuinely hit by it. So that's the kind of thing I've been developing a lot in now. I think I, it's funny, I had a conversation with Sam there. Um, I think we were just messaging the back and forth. I said, I'm not fucking making horror movies anymore. And, and, <laughs> and that was literally just a blip. It was one of those moments where I'd seen something I found offensive and, you know, and I kind of thought, that's it, I'm out of this, I'm not making more horror movies. And then practically immediately was, was writing dark shit again. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so it was literally one of those blips, you know. So I apologize for that, Sam, you know, so I was having like a... No, no, it's cool, man. I, in fact, like one of the things I've noticed um, from doing the In the Dark documentary, which you and Simon yeah. both feature in, you... Um, yeah. you, you quite evidently talk about having a drive to want to go towards uh, more ghost stories. Yeah, yeah. And I think Well that is actually true. Yeah, yeah. That's what you get from um from what you were describing with Winifred um, Meeks and the fact that you want to tell more emotional stories because uh, even me and Jack have been talking about this week where with ghost stories you are playing more with yeah. characters. It's not about horrifying people. You know, I think that's it. And, and one of the reviews we got, we got a review in France, a guy called um, Pascal Francaise, and he's a writer and a French critic. And he was saying that when, when he watched Winifred Meeks, that really it felt to him like a psychological drama with supernatural elements. And that was always the intention. I wanted to do a film about this woman and the fact that her boyfriend or her husband could be, you know, had been unfaithful to her and she'd gone off and rented this house, which she always does anyway when she writes a new book in this series of uh, teen crime novels, um, the Emma Hart mysteries, you know, kind of YA stuff, you know. Mm. And uh, she, uh, you know, she, so she's already in a kind of a dark place. But I got Bill Fellows, uh, who's a, a great Northern English actor. He's done a lot. He's in Broadchurch. He was in, he was in uh, Biker Grove, actually, for ages. Crikey. Um, and, uh, yeah, brilliant. But he does everything. He's in fucking everything. And he's actually, the funny thing is, at the moment, he's the voice of Captain Birdseye. So, which, which makes it even funnier <laughs> that he's only a voice in our film because he, he plays Lara's dad but he's only a voice on the phone because he'll ring her every you know every night and they'll have a chat and it's also a great way of moving the narrative on because she gets to confide in her dad you know that you know things aren't quite right but he in order to be like he's kind of part of the audience in a way because he takes a mickey out of her remember when you were 16 and she's like oh dad I'm not 16 anymore remember when you were 16 and you you, you went to uh, the graveyard because you were sure that the red lady was going to come on Midsummer's Eve and said yeah I was a child dad yeah but remember you know, so he's kind of yeah. goading her and taking the bit in the, in the way the audience might even with, I mean, other reviewers have said, is the house haunted at all? 
or is it her mind? You know, have things just gotten too much for her? And that's also a valid point. And mm. I'm never going to say to anyone, of course, it's fucking haunted. What do you want about you, <laughs> idiot? Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's subjective, it isn't. isn't it? You know what I mean? You know, but yeah. So whatever people, you know, it's like somebody could sit in a room and somebody, uh, you know, a table falls over. One person is convinced that it was poltergeist activity and the other person said, well, obviously wind got in somewhere or a cat came in and knocked it over. So you'll have those who are going to go, oh, no, it's all in her own mind or the others going, oh, no, it's definitely haunted. And I think it's what you bring to it. I'm sure you will agree. It's what you bring to the film. You want certain things, you know, or you don't want certain things, you know. No, no, definitely, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Jason, what's next? Well, here's the funny thing, and and it's 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 good in one way, you know, in terms of being asked that question. But we're actually the the, the next project that we have. I wrote a film called Bure's Dragon, and it's about a it's about a a, a career criminal on the run. And he ends up holed up at a, a woman's cottage because he's injured, and they end up developing this tentative relationship. And it's it's quite it's a hard edged story about two people who haven't got out of life what they wanted, and they're in their seventies now, both of them, and they may never get what they want out of life, but maybe they will. So it's like it's it's a kind of a, a tough drama with only three characters. Well, but there's a gagging order on it because I got three major British actors to star in it. Oh, nice. Right, because, because basically I went to this guy, and I, I can't, obviously I can't say who it is. I went to this guy doing my usual. He's the top of my list. I'm expecting to hear no, and I'll just move down the list until I get somebody out of EastEnders. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't mean that. You can, you can edit that, but I don't mean that because let's face it, the fucking actors in EastEnders are fucking brilliant or they wouldn't, they wouldn't be there. I mean, to convince, you know. Um, so basically I hit this guy and um, through his agent, the agent was the usual, is there money there? No, no, no. I want to do this the old fashioned way, the way they did when directors went to Warder Street with a fucking poster and they said... <laughs> Here's a movie. Will you give us money to make this movie if I can get these actors to be in it? And they go, yes. Now, that to me is a model that works. All of this bullshit of actors saying, no, we're not going to sign on to your movie until you're funded. How the fuck do you get funded unless you have people interested in your project? It's utter bullshit, right? So I'm always very upfront with people. I went to the agent and I said, look, here's the story. You know, you know, if the actor's interested, I will be using their name to try and raise finance on this. So, you know, immediately, she was immediately like, oh, God, we don't really do that anymore. And I said, look, allow the actor. I said, I met the actor. I, what? No, I didn't like <laughs> I met the actor once and uh, I told them that. And I said, we got on like a house on fire. And we actually did. We got on like a house on fire. I met them on set of a major project once, and uh, that I was visiting, <laughs> and uh, exactly, and they were the lead, and uh, I, I basically, yeah, got on really well with them. I'm nearly saying his name. Really got on well with this person, and uh, they said, "Oh, okay, so you know him?" And I said, "Well, a little bit." I said, "Will you let him make the decision?" I said, "Don't do the usual." of what you guys do and either read the script and chuck it in the bin or just chuck it in the bin and go, well, it's not funded, let's move on. And the girl got back to me and she said, okay, we'll give it to him. So, so it went from the, from dear, so it, it, no, it went from Jason, you know, ending with regards to, I got an email at three o'clock one morning, don't know why I got it that late. And it said, dear Jason. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then it says, such and such doo -doo, has read your script and absolutely loved it and said, not only um, not only will they star on your movie, but you can happily use their name to raise finance. That's brilliant. And I was like, fuck me. I said, that's, I woke my wife up and said, you won't believe it. I got bleep, bleep. bleep. <laughs> <laughs> so Google that bleep, bleep, and you might be able to figure out who it is. <laughs> I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do a bit of research yeah. on uh, what um, yeah, projects you were on set that. Oh yeah, exactly. Well, that's true. actually oh, shit. You actually, there's an article out there. Oh, anyway, <laughs> we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it between us. Don't worry. <laughs> you, 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 you figure out who it is. But they, but so it kind of you know it kind of went from there. Now what they what they said was now look, 
we're giving you this letter of intent and you can do that, but you cannot publicize that they're going to star in this movie. And they said the usual because what if your movie doesn't happen and then they're attached to something that never happened? It just doesn't look good for them. And I said, that's totally fine. I said, I'm more than happy to do that. So I then sent the script to somebody else, and they're, you know, a major British actress of television, not of movies, but highly respected since the late 60s on up. Sent it to her, ended up getting to her directly, which was amazing. And she, uh, she said, um, oh, I'll read it tonight. And then two days later, I heard nothing. And I thought, she doesn't like it. Um, then I get a message from her saying, sorry, Jason, my print is broken. Um, I'll get it to you as soon. I'll, I'll get on to you as soon as possible. About a week later, she goes, I absolutely love it. It's wonderful. She's an amazing character. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I want to play, do this movie. Who have you got? And I said, such and such is playing the main lead. Oh, my God. Always wanted to work with them. Excellent. So that was like I had two of them. And then the third um, I got, who's somebody I've admired for many, many years, uh, I- iconic uh, from the punk world, but she's amazing, absolutely amazing. And uh, so she came on board to play the third role, which is essentially the bad, the bad lady in the, in the movie. So, so we're working on that and trying to get it developed. But believe it or not, you're probably going to go. It's been done. It's been done only recently. I'm actually adapting Dracula from yeah. the novel. <laughs> That's, That's cool. amazing. And yeah, from the novel. So it's literally a straight adaptation of the novel. No silliness of any kind. A really straight adaptation of the novel. And I don't know whether you know Craig Conway. Craig Conway, brilliant fucking English actor. He's been in everything. He, he did a movie recently with, with uh, Gary Oldman. He told me a wonderful story from the set where where Craig had to do this... Um, Craig had to do this incredible monologue at the end of the film and he got very emotional and he said to Gary in a corner, he said, was that too much, Gary? Was that too much? And Gary said, I'm wearing a fucking eye patch for the whole fucking movie. It's all too much. (laughs) 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 From that moment on, they got on like a house on fire. They were like two naughty kids in the corner. I think I can picture the film you're talking about. I've seen a recent release of Gary Oldman in the... I patch some low budget British film. I haven't seen that. That must be it. That must be it. Well, Craig, he's been in everything. He was in Doom Watch, Dogs, Soldiers. He's the nice. really nasty Mohican guy in Doom Watch. The really nasty bugger in that. Um, but he's such a great actor, and he's going to be playing Jonathan Harker because, of course, if you read the novel, so much of the beginning of the film is the relationship between Dracula and Jonathan Harker, and it's incredibly interesting. All of this language that is never, ever used in a movie sets up who Count Dracula is, and you start to realize how complex he is. So I, again, it's almost going to be like a socio-realist, you know, version of Dracula with no That'd be really that's cool. Speaking exactly to the word of the novel. And I've already got great support now in Romania with some film production people in Romania who are going to get me this and the other. I've got the backing of Dacre Stoker, you know, who, who has written the prequel and is also a direct relation to, to uh, Bram. So it's all, it's all kind of building beautifully, you know. And also another amazing project, which I'm very, very happy to be working on, is we are doing a feature documentary on Jack the Ripper looking at uh, Dr. Francis Tumblety as the most likely um, uh, the most likely suspect based on brand new evidence which has emerged in the United States that's never been seen before. Oh, really? So that's a re- Yeah, so I've got the world's two leading experts on board this documentary um, to do it. So the, the top guys, one of them a naval uh, commander from the U.S. Navy and another guy, an ex-policeman from, uh, from um, Cambridgeshire. And the two of them have had loads of best-selling books, and they are just so, they're steeped in this. Um, so that's really exciting. So we've got that in, in development at the moment. So that's quite three cool. Three really, yeah, strong things, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I was going to ask you what your dream jo- uh, look, sorry, what your dream project would be, but I imagine with them three there, they're pretty much right up there. Well, no, to be quite honest, they are, but I would love, and you might laugh, I would love to direct a Bond movie. I would oh, absolutely nice. love it. <laughs> and I'm sure every filmmaker would. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure every filmmaker would. But I, again, I know what I'd love to do with this, you know? I know what I would love to do with the film. And, and you know the way, you, you know, as filmmakers, we would sit around and, we, and we're able to 
really put a strong idea on something that's really iconic because again we've been steeped in it you know you know growing up if you're a fan of the bond movies mm. so you kind of know just give me the fucking chance to do it and give me 200 million dollars and i will <laughs> give you a series of movie. it won't be quantum of solace you know i promise that's good, good. <laughs> remember us if you get a bond film i'd love to be in a bond film <laughs> If I get a Bond movie, everyone I know is coming. Yes. <laughs> everyone's on board. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. I mean, there's other things happening as well. There's other movies that I'm attached to do with some, you know, really cool guys um, working and developing stuff with um, with Stephen Arnold, uh, who's a really strong English actor who actually played um, Ashley Peacock on Coronation Street for many years. Okay. So developing something with him, and uh, he's really powerful. And it's funny, you think of him, it's this incarnation suit is this really kind of gentle you know guy who was always being put upon but in real life you know he's a he's in a you know a champion boxer and a, you know a tough guy you know That's crazy. um nothing like that. nothing like that party played and then also another project with, with bruce jones who played les battersby and um, so there's a lot of interesting really kind of grounded earthy kind of stuff that we're working on but again you know sam they're dark you know they're violent you know they're 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 there's probably so aggressive they're almost horror you know what i mean so they're kind of crossover in that sense because i i always feel with violence in films that you d there is a responsibility that if you're going to show violence show the nastiest violence so people don't you know they don't go out and think this is a fun thing to do show it at its nastiest and people go yeah that's horror that's that's genuine horror you know no, I completely agree. It's like um, how people respond to violence. So if you hear the agony and pain more, then you're going to think, oh, God, that's horrible. I remember you did that in uh, one of the short films for Gore Theatre. Yeah, which I've totally... I've given so much stuff to Sam and Tony. I can't remember what I gave <laughs> or what it's in. It's so funny. Tony reminds me, oh, such and such is coming out, and I go, what short did I give you for that? And he goes, I've no fucking idea what's in there. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not a bad thing, though, and you can see a lot of those films via Gore Theatre 1, Gore Theatre 2, home videos, yeah. I think you're in 1, 2, and 3. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of you out there. <laughs> I think, that, I think, and I also did one, and I think Sam held it up, Sam held up the production on the, the special one going out on Wild Eye that I don't think oh, yeah, I yeah. talked about yet. <laughs> it's yeah. done now, though, we got there in the end. We got there in the end, exactly. No, I look forward, I really look forward to that one. Because um, I had a great time. I got, my brother came over from the States and he starred in it for me. And uh, we had a lot of fun. A lot of fun doing that. It's good stuff. Well, Jason, really appreciate your time today. It's always nice to speak to a I fellow really film it. enthusiast. Really enjoyed it. And uh, you've you asked great questions, so it's kind of easy, you know. You give great answers. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Hey, if you want to make it a weekly thing, you know, <laughs> every Friday. <laughs> yeah, exactly.